Hello everyone and welcome or welcome back to my channel, where we discuss all things related to networking. In today's video, we're diving deep into the fascinating world of IP addressing and all the essential concepts that surround it. We'll be unraveling the mysteries of IP addressing, subnet masks, network classes, and more. It's important to grasp these concepts as they form the foundation of modern computer networks. And hey, if you're hungry for even more networking knowledge, don't forget to check out our blog. We regularly publish in-depth articles, tutorials, and resources to help you stay on top of the latest advancements in this ever-evolving field. Thank you for joining me today, and let's dive right into the fascinating world of IP addressing. Let's get started. In the vast landscape of computer networks, IP routing is the backbone that guides the flow of information from source to destination. Understanding the fundamental concepts of IP routing is essential for anyone venturing into network communication. At its core, IP routing is pivotal in facilitating seamless communication between devices within a network. Imagine the internet as a vast global network and IP routing as the GPS system guiding packets of data from their source to the intended destination. It ensures that data traverses the most efficient pathways, avoiding congestion, and delivering information swiftly. IP routing ensures that packets travel across networks, making their way through numerous routers until they reach the final destination. Routing protocols are the rules and algorithms that dictate how routers communicate and exchange information to determine the best paths for data transmission. Two main types of routing protocols exist static routing and dynamic routing. Static routing involves manually configuring routes on routers and making predetermined decisions about the paths packets should take. On the other hand, dynamic routing protocols automate the process by allowing routers to exchange information about network topology and make routing decisions dynamically based on current conditions. Dynamic routing protocols, such as OSPF, open shortest path first, or BGP, border gateway protocol, adapt to network changes and provide greater flexibility. We talk about routing protocols in a separate and dedicated video. Routing tables are the command centers of routers, storing vital information about networks and the best paths for forwarding packets. These tables contain a wealth of data, including destination addresses, next hop routers, and metrics to determine the most efficient routes. Routers refer to these tables during the decision-making process, comparing destination addresses with the information stored to determine the optimal path for packet transmission. Routing tables are dynamic, constantly updating as routers gather new information about network topology and adjust their routes accordingly. Now let's talk about the main topic of this video. IP addressing is the fundamental building block that enables devices to communicate over networks. Just as a postal address helps deliver mail to the correct destination, an IP address serves as a unique identifier for devices on a network. It allows packets of data to be routed and delivered to the intended recipients, enabling the exchange of information across various devices and networks. Without IP addressing, the internet as we know it would not exist. It provides a standardized method for devices to locate and connect with each other, whether it's a smartphone, a laptop, or a web server hosting a website. IP addressing forms the backbone of modern communication, allowing for seamless data transfer and facilitating the interconnection of billions of devices worldwide. IPv4 and IPv6 are the two major versions of IP addresses used in computer networks. IPv4, the older version, employs a 32-bit address space and uses a dotted decimal format, for example 192.168.0.1, to represent IP addresses. It provides approximately 4.3 billion unique addresses, which were once thought to be more than sufficient. However, with the exponential growth of internet-connected devices, IPv4 addresses have become scarce. To address the shortage of available addresses, IPv6 was introduced. IPv6 uses a 128-bit address space, providing an astronomical number of unique addresses, 340 trillion 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 IP addresses, 
Unlike IPv4, IPv6 addresses are represented in hexadecimal notation, separated by colons. IPv6 solves the address exhaustion issue and brings additional benefits, such as improved security and auto-configuration capabilities. IPv4 addresses are composed of 32 bits, divided into 4 octets. Each octet represents 8 bits and is separated by dots in the dotted decimal notation. For example, an IPv4 address can look like 192.168.0.1, where each octet ranges from 0 to 255. The address is divided into two parts, the network portion and the host portion. The network portion identifies the network to which the device belongs, while the host portion identifies the specific device within that network. The division between the network and host portions is determined by a subnet mask. A subnet mask is a critical component of IP addressing and plays a vital role in determining the network and host portions of an IP address. It helps define the boundaries of a network. Let's take a closer look at how a subnet mask works. We have this IP address 192.168.0.1 and a corresponding subnet mask of 255, 255, 255 The subnet mask acts like a filter, revealing which part of the IP address represents the network and which part represents the host. In this case, the subnet mask of 255, 255, 255, 0 indicates that the first three octets, 192, 168.0, represent the network, while the last octet, 1, represents the host. IPv4 addresses are further classified into different classes, A, B, C, D, and E. Each class has a specific range of addresses allocated for different purposes. Here's a brief overview of the address classes. Class A. This class is reserved for large networks such as major corporations or internet service providers, ISPs. The first octet of a Class A address ranges from 1 to 126, and the default subnet mask is 255.0.0.0. There can be up to 126 networks, each accommodating approximately 16,777,214 hosts. Class B addresses are assigned to medium-sized networks. The first octet ranges from 128 to 191. The default subnet mask is 255.255.0.0. There can be up to 16,382 networks, each supporting around 65,534 hosts. Class C addresses are typically used for small networks. The first octet ranges from 192 to 223. The default subnet mask is 255.255.255.0. With a Class C address, there can be up to 2,097,150 networks, each accommodating approximately 254 hosts. Class D addresses are reserved for multicast addresses, which are used for one-to-many communication. The first octet of a Class D address ranges from 224 to 239. Class E addresses are reserved for experimental purposes and are not used for general networking. The first octet of a Class E address ranges from 240 to 255. It's important to note that Class D and Class E addresses are not commonly used for general network addressing purposes. You may have noticed that the 127 range is missing from the table of IP address classes we discussed earlier. This is because the 127.0.0.0 range is specifically reserved for loopback purposes and is not assigned to any particular class. The reason for this reservation is to ensure that the loopback functionality remains consistent across all devices and networks. By dedicating the entire 127 range to loopback addresses, it eliminates any confusion or conflicts that may arise if it were to be allocated to a specific IP address class. Within the 127.0.0.0 range, the most commonly used loopback address is 127.0.0.1. However, the entire range from 127.0.0.0 to 127, 255.255.255 is reserved for loopback purposes. This allows for flexibility in assigning multiple loopback addresses within this range if needed. Loopback addresses are essential for testing network connectivity, diagnosing issues, and ensuring that network applications are functioning properly.
They provide a reliable means of verifying the network stack's integrity and the correct configuration of network-related software. And that brings us to the end of this video. I hope you found this informative and gained a better understanding of the essential concepts we explored. If you enjoyed this video and want to continue expanding your networking knowledge, be sure to check out our blog. We regularly update it with in-depth articles, tutorials, and resources to keep you informed about the latest advancements in the ever-evolving field of networking. To stay up to date with our future videos and never miss a new upload, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and click the notification bell. By subscribing, you become part of our growing community of networking enthusiasts. Thank you for joining me on this learning journey. I appreciate your support and engagement. If you have any questions or suggestions for future video topics, please let me know in the comments below. I value your feedback. Until next time, keep exploring, keep learning, and keep networking. This is Hell's Network, signing off. Take care and I'll see you in the next video.